Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, next episode of God Spoke to Me. I hope you can hear me okay. We're going to think tonight about this man called Billy Bray. I'm not sure if you've heard of him before, but Billy Bray was probably one of the most joyful Christians who ever lived. Um, he said, I can't help praising the Lord. He says, as I walk along the street, when I lift one foot, it says glory. And when I lift the other, it seems to say amen. And he says, they keep going on like that as I walk down the street. He was so exuberant and so joyful and so loud that some people took exception to it and said, listen, we're going to put you in a barrel. And he said, you can put me in a barrel if you want, but I'll shout glory through the bunghole. And he just couldn't be silenced. On his deathbed, when his doctor came to see him, he said, doctor, tell me the news. Tell me the honest truth. At what state am I in? And the doctor said, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that you're going to die. Billy shouted, glory, glory to God. I'm soon going to be in heaven. And then on a quieter note, he said, doctor, when I arrive there, can I give them your compliments and tell them that you're going to be coming soon? And this impressed the doctor greatly because at that stage, the doctor wasn't a Christian. And when he did die, the last thing he did, he shouted, just before he passed away, he shouted, glory. He was known as the glory man, and he was an exuberant, joyful Christian, Billy Bray. Well, he was born in a village just outside Truro um, in the late 1700s. His father and his grandfather had both been converted in the Wesley Revival. They were both Christians. His father died when Billy was still a young boy, and the family went to stay with the grandparents, the grandfather. And so he was brought up with a godly atmosphere in a Christian home. But when he was 17, he moved to Tavistock in uh, nearby Devon. And although he had had a pious upbringing, when he moved away from home, he threw himself into what he describes as a godless lifestyle. He started working uh, in the mines, and uh, in these days, in every village in the area, uh, in every village, there was a beer shop, and it wasn't long before uh, he was known as a notorious drunkard because he frequented these beer shops so uh, frequently, and he was the kind of drunkard who loved to finish the evening with a good fight. And so his notoriety spread pretty quickly. And he was very uh, loud. He was a wild man. And he threw himself into this lifestyle of abandon and drunkenness and disorder. He eventually took lodgings in a beer shop, which was the worst thing he could have done, of course. And that just was a decisive downward step in his condition. Uh, he realized that he was on a, a slippery slope, and he was, at that time, he said, diseased in body and in mind. He was afraid to go to sleep because he thought that he might awaken hell. And yet, during the day, he was so racked with pain and discomfort with what he'd gone through the night before. And yet, when it came to the end of his working day, he was back again, at it again. He was powerless to help himself, and this was the way he was living his life. He eventually returned to Cornwall, but when he returned there, he returned as a drunkard. He had married and he had children by this time, and he describes graphically the, the life, the miseries of being the wife of a drunkard and children of a drunkard. Many a time he would come home with his pay packet. Well, the pay packet was empty because he'd stopped off at the beer shop on the way home. And sometimes his wife would have to come and to bring him home from there. And the children and his wife were in absolute poverty because of his uh, habits, because of his uh, lifestyle. He had several near death experiences when he worked uh, on the mine. On one famous occasion, uh, he was working away and he heard what they called a scat, which was a kind of creaking or groaning noise. And the men who worked in the mine knew what that meant. And he immediately threw down his tools and ran. And seconds later, about 40 tons of rock crashed down in the place where he just had been standing uh, a few moments earlier. And these things uh, terrified him. But at the same time, he was powerless to change his lifestyle. 
he said at that stage, his conscience terrified him by day and his dreams terrified him by night. He had the upbringing, he knew the gospel, he knew about the Savior, he knew about the Word of God, but he seemed to be powerless to resist, to stop the urges, the impulses that he had, and he was living this life of abandon and recklessness and drunkenness. Well, one day someone gave him a book. It was a book written by John Bunyan. It wasn't The Pilgrim's Progress, which is John Bunyan's most famous work. It was a book alarmingly entitled Visions of Heaven and Hell. And he read this book and was quite alarmed by it. The visions of hell especially really impressed him. And in one of these uh, uh, chapters, as Bunyan writes this book, he imagines two men in hell, two friends in hell, who are cursing each other as being the author of their miseries. And Bun uh, Billy Bray had a drinking companion, a man called Code, and they would sit together and drink into the small hours of the morning. And the next time they were sitting down to drink, Billy Bray thought, shall Code and I torment each other in hell? And this was a dreadful thought to him, that one of his friends uh, would one day be with him in hell, and they would be tormenting each other and cursing each other that they'd landed up in this place. And these things really spoke to him. And from that point onwards, Billy Bray, he resolved that he would be a better man. Well, it turned out his wife had professed to be a Christian before she was married when she was a young girl, but she'd gone away from the Lord. And he started to say to her, why don't you begin again? And he had this idea that if his wife got back to the Lord, if his wife was converted, then she would be able to help him. He thought, well, she's not the sinner that I am. It'll be easier for her to be converted. If she was converted, if she got back to God, then maybe she could help me. This was how he was thinking. And um, one night he returned home, it was his payday, and it was the first time in the marriage that he'd brought home a full pay packet. And he said to his wife, she was quite startled, he said to his wife, you'll never see me drunk again. And that night, he didn't even wait for his food. He went up to his room and he took with him his Bible and a book of Wesley's hymns, a hymn book of Charles Wesley's hymns and John Wesley's hymns. And he went up to his room and that evening he knelt on the floor and he prayed to God and he wept and he cried and he read and he read the hymn book and he read his Bible and he knew the story of the cross. He knew the story of the Lord Jesus. He knew that Christ had died on the cross for his sins and he raised from the dead. But as he read it over and over again, it just didn't make sense to him. He couldn't understand how it could have anything to do with him. And this went on for the next week. When Monday came, he wasn't able to go to work. He was in such a state. And he would be lying on the floor, crying to God, praying, reading his Bible, reading his hymn book, trying to find the reason, the answer to his problems. And he just couldn't see it. Well, eventually he had to return to work because they were only paid when they worked. So eventually he had to return to work. But he describes that during the day, he'd be working underground in the mine and he would be, such was the burden he was under, he would be crying out loud and weeping and praying out loud and calling to God to have mercy on him, even when his colleagues, his workers were all around him. And they were absolutely amazed. They knew the kind of man he was, and they just didn't understand what was going on. They thought they'd lost his mind. And he was anxious and earnest to find salvation, to find eternal life. Well, one evening, it was in November 1823, he came home. And as his custom was uh, during this period, he didn't even wait for his meal straight upstairs, onto his knees, praying to God, got his Bible out, got his hymn book out, and he started to read the Bible. And he started to read in Matthew's Gospel. And he got to chapter 7. And this verse he, he read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Listen to this. The words of Jesus. This is what Billy Bray read. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Billy Bray put his Bible down. He thought about this for a minute. 
And in a moment, he realized that asking and seeking and knocking were actions that were illustrations of faith. And that what God was really asking him to do was just to believe and just to trust and just to take God at his word. And he knew that the Lord Jesus had died on the cross for sinners. He believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He just couldn't see how it would affect him until he read this verse and he realized God is just asking me to take him at his word and to believe what he says and to ask and to seek and to knock. And listen to what he said. In his own words, he said, I said to the Lord, Thou hast said, They that ask shall receive, they that seek shall find, and to them that knock it shall be opened. And he said, I have faith to believe it. And at that moment, he was flooded with the peace and the joy and the assurance of salvation. He was relying on the word of God, on what God had said, on what Christ had done on the cross. And at that moment, he was transformed. He was completely changed. He said himself, I was a new man altogether. He went downstairs and told the startled wife and children what had happened. And soon everyone was talking about the fact that Billy Bray had been converted. It had a tremendous effect on other people. The first person to be converted was his wife. She saw the change in her husband's life, and she was the first, she was his first convert. She came to know the Lord Jesus and trusted him. And then his friends and his colleagues at work, they began to realize that his life had changed, and although some mocked him to begin with, it wasn't long before many of those were converted as well. And Billy himself, he loved to sing and to shout and to leap with the joy of salvation. And that was the hallmark of the rest of his life. He had been loud before he was converted. Well, after he was converted, he was even louder still. And he became known, his joy in the Lord was really infectious. And he became known as the glory man. And he and his wife and family lived really for the rest of their days in poverty because they gave whatever they had to others. And they lived to spread the gospel message. He died when he was 74. And in his lifetime, he had never ceased every day publicly and audibly and loudly to praise God that that moment had come in his life when God spoke to him through his word and he had really asked and he had sought and he had knocked and he believed, he had the faith to believe that God would answer and God would give and God would open just as the Lord Jesus had said. Well, on his deathbed, a friend asked him, Billy, have you any fear of death or of being lost? And he replied, what? Me have a fear of death? Me have a fear of being lost? He said, why, my Savior conquered death. And listen to what he says. He said, if I were to go down to hell, I would shout glory to my blessed Jesus until the bottomless pit rang with it. And he said, miserable old Satan himself would have to say, Billy, you're in the wrong place. You better get out of here. And he said, I would go up to heaven shouting all the way, glory to God, praise the Lord. Well, within an hour, the glory man was in the glory of heaven. That's the story of Billy Bray. Uh, he was quite a, quite a character. It's well worthwhile reading the book. There have been several books written about him, but one... Uh, an older book, famous one, that's very worthwhile reading. But, dear friends, I want to ask you this question before we finish tonight. Do you have the joy of salvation? Do you have the assurance of salvation? Can you say, yes, I'm absolutely certain that if death were to come to me, if I were to be passing through death at this moment, I cannot say with Billy Bray that, that how can I fear death? My Savior's conquered death. He died for me on the cross. I've relied upon him, and I know I'm going to be saved. I know I'm going to be in glory. Dear friends, can you say that? Have you trusted the Savior? Just remember this, that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he has done everything that God requires for your salvation. He's paid the price. He has paid the great debt. 
And when he arose from the dead, God was telling everyone that he was pleased with what his son had done and it had fully satisfied him. And all he asks you to do is simply take God at his word. Believe, rely. And then the words of the verse that spoke to Billy Bray, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Have you done that? Maybe not in such a dramatic way as Billy Bray, but I wonder, can I ask you, have you relied upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you got the joy of salvation? Have you got the assurance of salvation? Do you know your sins are forgiven and you're bound for heaven? You can have it and you can have it at this very moment. We're going to close with a prayer. If you've never ever trusted the Lord Jesus for yourself, now is the time to do it. Now is the only time. Now is the best time. And as we bow our heads and pray, if you've never trusted the Savior, do what Billy Bray did. Take God at his word and trust him because he died to take the guilt and the punishment for your sins. Let's just bow now and pray. Father, we give thanks for the wonderful conversion of a man like Billy Bray. He was a loud man. And he loudly proclaimed uh, the glory of Christ and the joy of salvation. We pray for any who are listening to whom perhaps this is completely foreign and utterly strange. We pray that somebody uh, may, even this very evening, trust in the Lord Jesus, believe in him, and know the blessed joy and the assurance of salvation. We pray for thy blessing. We pray for thy help as we give thanks. In the Lord's name, amen.